Welcome, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, I'm very happy that you're joining us today. Basically, I don't have to introduce you to uh, Professor Patrick Müller, who is our very own, um, jointly uh, appointed by us and the University of Vienna, uh, Professor of European Studies. And um, he's going to be the first in two lectures, actually, on populist uh, foreign policy. Um, as part of the Peaceful Change lecture series that is sponsored by the Austrian Research Association. And uh, next week, we're going to hear Reinhard Heinisch. Uh, that's on the 17th of January, 6 p.m., uh, on conspiracy and populism. Um, and today, it's Patrick Müller on populism and EU foreign policy. And uh, he's gonna talk for about half an hour. Um, then we're gonna have time for questions and answers. And afterwards, we have a brief reception, actually a nice reception out there, uh, just in front of the room. So then Patrick, without any further ado. Sure. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks a lot, Marcus. And uh, thanks, of course, uh, to all of you for being here um, today with us. Uh, as we have heard, there seem to be many prime ministers in the house, uh, <laughs> some for real and some imagined. Um, uh, so, so again, uh, competition seems to be quite tough, and it's wonderful to to have you here, especially um, on a topic uh, like populism and foreign policy. I think if we would have done this topic maybe some 10, 15 years ago, uh, we would have had very few of you um, here. It's, uh, it's a topic that really. And many people didn't um, care too much about, especially in a European context. And I remember when I came to the Diplomatic Academy, the first uh, seminar that I, I offered was uh, a course on populism and view foreign policy. And at that time, it really uh, wasn't easy to find a uh, literature um, on all the course um, sessions. And uh, I continued the course, and by now this is not anymore uh, uh, really a problem. There have been a lot of uh, excellent publications on it, and a colleague is here now uh, who uh, was also part of facilitating a special issue on populism and foreign policy. So it becomes quite a, a rich field, and it's approached from from various um, perspectives, uh, and that makes it also quite interesting to to talk about it and to take stock. What I would like to do uh, is the following. So I would first um, like to say a few words about. Um, the foreign policy of the European Union to give you um, a little bit of background and then uh, to go into the theme of populism and see, you know, how do they connect, what's the relation and uh, then to conclude with a, a recent article where we did a case study on, on Hungary. I think that's also um, really, you know, it's a, a case study that, that many use, not only um, a kind of in the academic literature, but we can also see that Hungary becomes kind of... Um, almost like uh, a model that uh, others look forward. So if you watch, for example, on CNN, uh, not on CNN, there you see him at uh, less times on Fox News, uh, Tucker Carlson, you will see that he makes an awful lot of references to Hungary. And uh, that's not coincidental, right? Um, there's interesting things also going on uh, on this level. Um, I have uh, prepared some wonderful slides uh, here for you here today until I found out that we don't uh, have uh, the slide option, but it still helps me at least to, to structure my talk. Um, so when we talk about foreign policy, I think it's important to you know be aware that um, populism is one aspect that uh, Europe has to deal with in a situation where many things are happening. Many things happen outside the European Union, now the latest is, of course, the war in Ukraine. Um, but uh, even before that, you know, we talked a lot about uh, geopolitical change. We talked about the rise of China. We talked about a U.S. foreign policy that, um, especially during the Trump presidency, has become far less um, predictable, which also had something to do um, with populism. So uh, we often tend to speak by now of a poly crisis, uh, meaning that Europe faces various challenges abroad and internally. And internally, we can list things like Brexit, uh, still for some countries quite important, the repercussions of the 2008 financial crisis, migration, rise of populism. Now, of course, energy is a big issue, um, the COVID crisis, um, all these things. So we have uh, Europe really in a constant crisis mode in a time where populism is also challenging Europe um, 
from within uh, on norms on values. And you see it uh, you know, in the literature, there's more and more talk about the contestation um, of the EU model, um, about politicization of certain issues. So it connects to other uh, important uh, elements. It's not the sole driver, but it's uh, a, a broader debate. Um, and, and that's quite interesting because when you look at the, the literature, and I hope you know some of you take also this kind of more academic uh, interest, um, you see that you know we have been concerned with very different questions for a long time. Now we have been concerned with you know how Europe works as a foreign policy actor, how it evolves, how it becomes more integrated, and then we have also become interested now in looking at question of normative power Europe. So what are the values uh, and Europe stands for now, especially Article Two values, democracy, human rights, um, uh, rule of law. Um, and uh, that Europe also saw it, uh, itself as a model, uh, not only as a model for um, these values, but really also in a way, you know, as a model that coincides with all this talk and literature, you know, about global governance, about making international relations more rule governed, uh, of transferring authority to international institutions. And Europe was really in a, in a nice fit. You now it was a model that kind of, um, um, assembled this approach to international relations within a regional context, and it saw um, itself also as a model for more international relations. And here, the populism is doing um, interesting things. But before I, I want to talk about it, I want to say that this is not purely an academic debate. And for those of you, you know, who have more an interest kind of in the real world of politics, I always advise, you know, my students to read two documents. Read the 2003 security strategy of the European Union. So kind of the first, you know, big document where Europe reflects on its um, role in the world and how it sees international relations and compared it to the 2016 security strategy. And I give you just, you know, a, a couple of examples. So in 2016, um, uh, you know, the global strategy says things like, you know, we, we live in times of existential crisis within and beyond the European Union. Our European project is under threat and is being questioned. And it talks about this world, you know, that's kind of contested and at the same time very integrated uh, and, and complex, right? And, um, and if you compare this to 2003, you know, you have these sentences that we have never been so prosperous, so secure, you know, so free. It's um, a period of peace and stability. There's an increasing convergence of European interests. And it was really kind of, you know, this approach that Europe has to contribute with its own experience to make a better world, right? So we have kind of sobered up to a new reality where many of the fundamentals that we saw, you know, are essential for international relations are being questioned. And this is also doing something uh, to Europe. And part of this being questioned um, has to do with um, populism. Uh, so we can see that... Um, Populism is on the rise. So when you look at election results, we can see that, that there's a certain, you know, some people talk about the wave, but you know, can definitely see that you know, there's um, populism has become a prominent phenomenon uh, in Europe. And we have uh, certain governments where they not uh, only you know do well in election, but where they govern for long periods of time, right? And that has given uh, also rise uh, to the possibility to study. What actually happens also to broaden policy when um, we are governed by populists, right? And this is what I want to talk about um, in more detail today. But before doing so, um, I would just like to ask you, because you know you came to the seminar, um, if you're not confused and wanted to go to some of the prime ministers, now you came to the seminar um, because uh, you know it had populism in the title. So, uh, who of you would like me to give uh, uh, some definition of what is populism? You are nodding? Yes, you're sitting in the first row. That's wonderful. So, okay, go ahead. Give it a shot. Uh, no, I thought you were going to give it a shot. <laughs> 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 that's the same misunderstanding. That's the same misunderstanding like of the prime ministers. No? I would like you to give me it. No, uh, would you like to give me more? I don't uh, have one. You don't have one? Anybody? I think it's uh, people who are uh, not uh, so well schooled, mm -hmm. uh, who are uh, based their feelings on emotions mm -hmm. and on uh, have the 
end of getting power. Mm -hmm. There's some, you know, especially when you talk about the emotions, you know, that is uh, quite prominent uh, in some, you know, um, spheres of the popular literature. You know, on not so well schooled. Do you know actually what um, what uh, Orban wrote his master thesis on? There's a lot of Bamsky in his master thesis. I learned so he really studied populism, right, as a theoretical concept. Uh, uh, he's quite well versed. So I wouldn't, you know, underestimate um, them. You know, uh, you know, uh, uh, in general terms, different when you talk about who votes for populist parties, etc. Any other try? Yes. Hmm? Uh, populists give simple uh, answers to very complex questions. I come from the UK. Yes. 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 Talk you know, in ways where you simplify you know, yeah. and, and don't overburden and they don't, don't you know make sure that anybody still invites you. you know? So so um so if you look you know at the different definitions of what populism is, um, but you know, if you look at it more in ideological terms, you know, it is you know this argument that you distinguish on moral grounds between um the good um, people that you represent. As the, uh, as the populist you now and the corrupt elite. And it's very important, you know, that this is a moral distinction because, of course, you know, there are reasons to make uh, certain distinctions also mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. on other parts. Good. And, and you already, mm -hmm. well, uh, yeah. And, and, you know, the other aspect is that on this, you know, what, what is called the sin center ideology, that you make this distinction, you add an additional ideology, the so called post ideology. And, you know, if you are with the right party, it's often this nationalist, nativist ideas that you add. Okay, but it's important that this is, you know, what we will talk about a lot here today. And um, this um, example of populism, what is the definition of populism? I think what's also uh, important is, you know, that populism is not, um, you know, on, 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 uh, at odds with democracy, you know, on all aspects of democracy, mm -hmm. particularly at odds with the liberal aspect of democracy. Mm -hmm. Um, so it uh, accepts popular sovereignty, um, exercise majoritarian power, elections, etc. Okay. But it's against this liberal constraint. Think about, you know, this fund that raises like this post charges, you know, this kind of diminishing, you know, of certain powers that infringe on the will of the people represented by the um, populists. Good. And, and on that level, um, you know, populists also take, you know, issues with many aspects of um, global governance um, and the European Union. Why? Because here you have layers of decision making that quite, are quite far away from the people that are often not very transparent, that are often very technocratic and not directly um, elected. So even so, populists at very different, you know, kind of ideologies, um, they share certain traits and then are clustered in different groups of populists. Good. Let me maybe conclude, you know, just a more uh, academic part by saying that, you know, not all authors in the literature necessarily, necessarily see that populism, which is often scandalized you now uh, in the liberal media, is necessarily or has necessarily to be a bad thing for politics. You know, that there were, you know, um, some uh, have argued, uh, for example, you know, that um, what populists do is to talk about emotions, collective identities, you know, and uh, they also contribute, uh, you know, to a politicization at a time where, um, you know, um, politics had become so similar. It was increasingly difficult to distinguish mainstream parties. You know? So they uh, have different, you know, they're different approaches. Even so, by now, I think we don't have to be too concerned with a uh, too low degree of politicization and contestation also in Europe. So uh, the question arises, you know, how does this connect to foreign policy? And I think the easiest uh, is always to say in some countries, you know, we have populists who govern these countries matter, and it's interesting to study this. But populists also, of course, they can exercise uh, influence on foreign policy in countries where they don't govern. Now, that, for example, you know, if they pressure parties to take on certain positions, of course, they get afraid they will not get good in the next elections. Now, uh, parties that govern, even though they're not populist, may adopt political lines and positions similar to populist parties. 
right? So they can also be kind of this this effect. And then, of course, uh, populists shape how we talk about certain things. Now, they shape the discourse. And also what they do is through uh, party connections, but also through civil society institutions, they also, uh, on a transnational level, spread populist um, ideas. Good. Yeah, and maybe I, I um, add a third component that is you know, uh, interesting, I think, to observe in the literature, and that is the question, uh, to what extent populists also serve as a transmission belt of the influence of external actors in the European Union. So there is, of course, the question about party financing of Russia of certain parties which, uh, in Europe, but also about kind of, you know, there are articles about how uh, populist governments serve as Trojan forces for the influence of external actors. So that's another you know, issue, how they contribute to the debate uh, in Europe. Good. So let, uh, let's look uh, very briefly at the example of, you know, what happens in a country the populist government. And uh, jointly with a colleague uh, from Hungary, um, I became interested in looking at especially what happens to national foreign policy institutions. So we looked at the National Foreign Ministry in Hungary and tried to find out you know, what happens. It's interesting for several reasons. Why? Because in Hungary, you have populists that are not only in power, but they have defended power in subsequent elections. They are in government with a constitutional majority since 2010. So they uh, have a lot of power to influence foreign policy. Okay, so they're not in a coalition government, but they're the minor party, etc. And at the same time, they had quite some time to consolidate their ideas and their ideology to influence. And then we wanted to see basically what happens uh, in a foreign ministry that has been quite committed for a long time under mainstream party to European values, to European integration. And I just give you not to make it too academic, you know, um, a, few, uh, a few information. So in the beginning, not too many things happened, all right? There was a, a time, we won the election in 2010, and until the next election uh, in 2014, you didn't really care all that much about foreign policy. I think it was 2011, where Hungary also held the presidency of the European Union. So they kind of, you know, um, didn't interfere too much they betted a lot on established um, diplomats. They appointed a foreign minister that was quite considered moderate. Also with inflation, which kind of evolved into right and populist parties, there were more liberal elements still left. And you kind of didn't want to interfere so much. What did happen actually was that um, you focused a lot on the domestic side of things. Okay, so you kind of focused on um, uh, um, on the media. You focused on um, um, rule of law issues, the justice system, that was in the focus, right? And within that, uh, uh, civil service law was passed. It was not made for the foreign ministry, but for the civil service sector more generally in 2011 that allowed you to dismiss civil service on many grounds, including, you know, if they were not loyal, etc. So really, you established a lot of control. What you also did was you took the most important things to your domestic agenda out. And that was the coordination of certain EU matters. We went directly to the Justice Minister, the ministry that was very aligned with part of the British um, interest, if you want to call it that way. But but otherwise, we didn't interfere so much. And then something interesting happens because, as we said, now you have the, the populist who is for the people and against the elite becoming prime minister, taking over the government, uh, previously focusing very much on the political opposition. Uh, um, and, and previous parties in government as their main uh, corrupt elite. And then they switched, and the corrupt elite became Brussels. And Brussels became very much in the focus um, of their rhetoric. Uh, and after 2015, major changes happened in the foreign ministry. So you have um, a, a, um, a change of staff. So up to 70% uh, of the staff was changed for new staff. Um, Often they came from the Swedish news organization and the younger staff out of circles close um, to um, the Orban government. Um, so they were already quite um, loyal. And apart from these changes, you changed how you promote people and then also how you train people. So there was a new Hungarian diplomatic academy founded that trains a new generation of diplomats and you can look at the curriculum and you can look at the priorities and they shift more and more away 
from EU values, from liberal values, they become more about you know, Christian conservative values, they become more about national interest and not about European interest. You see within the divisions of the foreign ministry, major changes. So you see that um, EU-related topics and stuff become less relevant, are downsized. Um, you have a so-called Eastern opening initiative where you really focus on trade relations with um, Eastern European countries um, as also a counterbalance to the European Union. And you really, you know, uh, derive the situation where priorities change, but also organizational culture and ideology changes. And I think that, you know, there's more and more evidence that um, populists in Hungary, they really take ideology not simply as a tool to reach power and populism as a um, rhetoric device uh, for political ends, but they really develop um, their ideas further, they're related to foreign policy, and they become um, up with quite a, a consistent ideological agenda that then allows you to turn um, a ministry around and to turn it not only in a weaker of a centralized government, but uh, almost like, you know, in, in, um, into a mechanism that contributes to the ideological profile of Yiddish. And that is also something you see in Hungary, that state institutions are almost turned, uh, it's very difficult to distinguish um, the purpose of the state institutions from think tanks that serve also the ideological debate uh, for um, the Yiddish party. So it's it's um, a quite interesting and, and far-reaching um, developments that uh, the field served, and of course it takes us to to, to further um, yeah, research themes um, um, that I don't want to go into in greater depth because I think they reach also my limit in terms of time. Um, but yeah, um, uh, I think that uh, what's nice is um, that as a case study country, they had really time to um, um, and work on these longer uh, processes. Because if you look uh, and compare this, to, for example, to literature in the US context that studied uh, the Trump administration, what you see is that, you know, what really happened in the State Department was it became um, increasingly chaotic, right? But it was not a very systematic change of institutionalizing new ideas and agenda, but it was rather changing bits and pieces there and different uh, elements around Trump arguing, you know, about what matters in international relations. So there was not a con consistent ideological framework that could guide you. And uh, the result was uh, more chaos <laughs> and, and, and problems, not then reorientation. In Hungary, you don't have this. In Hungary, that has to do with, you know, the way the British party works, the investments they made, uh, and also developing the ideology. The time they had, the, the, you know, the successive election victories um, that they have, so, so it's also interesting to make this kind of comparisons. Good. Thank you so much, and uh, looking forward to questions. And I can see some students for sure will have interesting questions to ask. Good. <laughs> Patrick, thanks very much. Uh, I anticipate quite a lot of questions. I can see that on your faces are always bundled three in in in, in three at a time. So whoever wants to go first, please. Um, about populism and the new technology, social media, and so on. Obviously, populism existed for a long time and predates uh, social media, the internet, and so on. But the social media and the internet, in my view, facilitates uh, populism, and it's been a, a major factor for Trump and Orban and, and others. So what's your view on this? And, yeah. uh, how, do you, how do you control it uh, so that, the, let's say, in the EU uh, parliament, uh, they're not overly, you know, swayed by, let's call them outliers. I think you can, oh, wait, let me just bundle. Okay, so that's that's the first one. Second, yes. <laughs> yes, and coming back to this whole issue of defining populism, this strange animal. Uh, I mean, conventionally, we've always had talked about political movements and that being left, right, and center. But how does populism fit in on this old spectrum? Does it make any sense to speak of that, or, or can it be anywhere along that spectrum? <laughs> Thank you. That's an important question. I think. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, what I was wondering was, given that you were speaking about the EU foreign policy and then populism, 
You mentioned at the beginning the differences in the strategy between 2003 and 2015, and that there have been some significant changes between those two versions of strategy. So the changes that we see, do you think that they have contributed to the rise in populism, or has populism arisen out of the fact that these changes happened in our Good. Three questions I can edit. Yeah. <laughs> I gave you a pen in yeah. order to make sure. Yeah, no, we were great for round yeah. two. <laughs> Good. I, I just proceed, you know, in, in the order that we ask. And, you know, there's a lot of literature on populism and in the media. One, one reason for that is, you know, that there are these arguments that populists like to communicate directly, right? So you don't want to go through journalists, you know, and opinion makers, etc. but you try to establish this direct path. Now, in new media, and you saw Trump now, how, how Twitter was already, you know, already, boom, now of attention. I, I had a colleague, now she was working on Twitter communication and foreign policy, and she said Trump for her was the best thing that could happen to her thesis project because it got all this attention now on how media is used, uh, new media is used also by populism, and definitely it makes things easier now you can get unmediated access uh, to voters now on a broad scale very, very quickly now, uh, very immediate. Um, and of course, it raises questions you know, that are much broader than populism, and that is how you deal with a new media landscape. And, and I think that you know, increasingly in Europe, also when you look at you know, more strategic documents, you, you see that the you know, big topic becomes you know, resilience that of societies against all kinds of threats, you know, and disinformation and all this plays into this. Now, so, of course, you know, but one thing is more and more how to counter this. And, and I think that also, you know, in a changing international system, Europe and other you know, liberal democratic systems, we have always been designed and designed to be open. You now, open was always our version. Now, we we agree in terms of you know speech, of association, of all these things. Now, and and you wonder, you know, how open can you afford to be in a situation where you know others uh, abuse and thrive on this uh, openness? Um, but what goes on the strategic level in terms of you know how you deal with the situation and how you defend yourself? A lot of things are moving. And of course, there's a very broad academic literature that relates to this, this to populism. Yeah. Um, populism and the left right uh, center. And I think, you know, again, the different, you know, notions of what populism uh, is, is the discourse, is a strategy. But if you take, uh, talk about it as an ideology, again, I mean, um, populism, the, the, you know, the sin part, you can dock on almost any, you know, kind of ideology. And this is why you distinguish left populist parties from right populist parties, and it's important when you think, for example, about works that relate populism to international relations, they need to make this a distinction because they take very different positions now on many aspects of international um, relations. Um, 2003 and 2016 um, strategy and how this um, relates to um, the rise of populism um, I mean, I, I think that, you know, by, by, by 2016, a lot of what you find in this document, you, you see, um, it's, it's not for nothing now that when, when, you know, the 2006 um, strategy says, um, we live in times of existential crisis, not only, you know, beyond European borders, but within, it's quite clear, you know, what they refer to, you know, and that this kind of domestic, um, aspects is, um, is part of it. Um, and 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 I do think that you know that um, that for populist discourse, of course, you know the, the 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 liberal international order, especially for the right wing elements, is a major you know a point of uh, contestation, but also something quite prominent in the discourse. Now, if you I do this with students often, that we look at you know um, speeches from Viktor Orban, and you can see that you know he takes issues, and it's a big element, and and it maybe drives it drives maybe also on on, you know, being able to um, contest this particular system. So I think there are uh, interrelations, of course, in the foreign both directions. Thank you. Now we're going to go to the next round of three. Yes, please. But given that, uh, in the public space and the idea that the giant rule of the uh, public is going to and the public is also associated with the cases and Brexit, uh, my question to you is whether this question to be made whether populism can also be associated with a strong European approach, meaning that the world is built on the future, and don't be in favor of the 
Thank you. Another one? Otherwise, I'm going to, yes, please. Uh, actually, I hope, hope you will allow two questions. What if, what, what is what you think is, is the impact of conspiracy theories? This is, this is quite uh, prominent. Uh, quite prominent in America, you know, what is the deep state up to people like Marjorie uh, Taylor Greene and so on. And the other thing is the impact on this uh, whole situation, of what the situation of uh, the electoral system. In the UK, you've now got the situation whereby formerly a broad church, stable centre right political party has effectively been captured by the populist agenda behind uh, Brexit. And this is leading my country to disaster. Uh, you, you have something similar uh, in the case of the United States, where the grand old party yeah. seems to be sort of falling apart. But in part, this large these parties because they keep winning to the minority of the folk because of this uh, sort of first part of the process. We have one more, yes, in the back. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, you can see there is a lot of uh, talk about uh, information on the topic. And even the fact that the government is not as strong as the government, I was just wondering if you think uh, um, uh, in, in in kind of science and movement, this look into the administration trying to find a certain more influence uh, of this agenda in, in Europe. Um, in taking over a different role model of family that uh, possibly integrated but the part of the region would uh, undermine the whole European project in this uh, unsecure human of that level. But, Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Good. Yeah. Um, uh, could there be also a populist that takes a, a, a pro-European uh, position? I think that um, you know the the debate is actually probably more pronounced and uh, nuanced than you know one 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 takes. You know when. When reading uh, media headlines, because if you study, for example, you know, go back to the Hungarian case and study public opinion on the European Union, you see that quite many Hungarians are highly in favor, strongly in favor, uh, uh, very pro European. All right. So, uh, uh, Orban, when he criticizes the European Union, it's not, uh, you know, we leave the European Union or that we don't like uh, the European Union per se, it's more that we want to change the European Union. So, we don't accept. The liberal model of the European Union, the one the European Union, for example, more rooted in Christian cultures, values, etc. No? So then it always depends on how do you define a uh, pro European <laughs> yeah. and, and, and Euroscepticism, definitely a lot of Euroscepticism in the way it's constituted at the moment. No? But always uh, having public opinion not in mind. No? And, and, and uh, so, so, so I think there are probably more um, uh, uh, laws. Um, then, you know, the, the, the aspect of conspiracy theory and, you know, deep state and, and these arguments, I, I didn't study, you know, these aspects in depth, you know, I'm aware of, of these debates. It's often also that, you know, as a populist, you want to victimize the people and, you know, get kind of placed into it. But what I always found more important and also interesting is um, that, you know, when you look at what are often approaches, I think, you know, any questions, you know, often comes then, you know, how do you deal with it? Um, you know, there, there's often, you know, the ways you uh, ostracize populists, you demonize them, you don't want to have anything to do with them, you don't want to touch them, you don't want to govern with them. Um, and, and you know, uh, one could think, you know, that that's good moral uh, standards, but at the same time, it also feels um, uh, to a certain situation where you don't really take serious the issues populist parties um, um, strive on. Um, and uh, populists to succeed, I think they benefit from you know, conditions that are real and problems that are real. And even when I look at, without starting this in depth, on maps who votes for populists, now you could uh, see that these are not the winners 
of globalization and the liberal economy. Now, so you could say, you know, of course, they are primitive, they are not educated, they are whatever, but you could also say they are quite interest states. So, right? And maybe people who support Brexit because uh, supported uh, um, exit from the European Union um, because they didn't pay to serve them very well, you know, and maybe because they're really those who serve the least, right? So, so I think that um, all this is important, you know, but I think it's also important not to lose sight of the fact that populists right on their issues, and if you don't tackle them, um, you also empower them, and 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 I think that's that's also an important aspect of the picture. Um, Integration of Hungary in the Western Balkans, uh, I really don't know anything about it. <laughs> That's a, a question I, I, I leave maybe for our next <laughs> speaker to come here. Um, um, but uh, of course, I mean, what you, uh, what you can uh, say more structurally about the European Union, and I think that's quite interesting, is um, that you know, Europe, especially the enlargement rounds, the previous one, they were a kind of coming of a time of considerable optimism, if not hype, right? So in the architecture of the European Union, the mechanism, for example, to exercise conditionality on countries that join the European Union and then don't live up to it, they were designed in a way as if this would be isolated examples. I mean, we have an article 7 proceedings, so it can be both, but as soon as we have two countries, like Hungary and Poland, that support each other, it becomes two steps. So now we need new mechanisms, all right? So of course, I mean, among the four countries, uh, the concern to add new members to a situation that's already complex and that you don't have this firm belief that once you join, you are on a stable path for democracy, advises certain questions. And that you don't have these concerns when you are uh, anyway, uh, not very much in favor of the best liberal values in the European Union, that's of an issue with this kind of thing, so I think that can also translate into more favorable position on the Western Balkans, but again, I'm not an expert. Thank you. Next round of questions. I'm just going to continue with the others, and if we still have room, we can in the second round. Yes, in the back, please. And that's... Uh, yeah, well, my question is something that doesn't... I think a few days ago, I was reading a report, which means that it's going to be 400 million euros for the living states in the at the start of the with this in mind, do you think it's useful for biologists to remain popular with the people that are involved in the decade and does it depend on the people? Exactly. Good. Um, yeah, I think the relationship of populist nationalism we touched upon it now that you have. Uh, different host ideologies that you can add to populism. And of course, um, you know, if you look at the, the right-wing aspect um, of populism, you know, that uh, important policy translates often into this argument, you know, we want to put national interests first, right? In Europe, it is quite challenging in a foreign policy that's very consensus-based, based on um, informal norms. Um, so, so that's definitely, you know, an an important aspect. How, how durable will populism be? Uh, I think that's a, a question that, you know, the future has to answer. But what I think I would really caution about is this idea, you know, that we have in some conversation when you talk, uh, for example, again about the Hungarian case, you know, maybe over the use of an election and then it's kind uh, of over. And um, I mean, uh, you see that um, the Orban government and Fidesz, they invest a lot in civil societies and a long time uh, and, and, and very big uh, sums of money. So I think that even if um, Fidesz would be election in Hungary at one point, you know, these elements will stay in society and these uh, ideas will stay active. I do believe, you know, I, without having done research with myself, but, you know, if I judge the literature, that populism do thrive on crisis in certain conditions. But again, as mentioned before, then if you want to take wind out of their sales, you would really need in a serious way to address those issues um, rather than to demonize populists um, and think, you know, by ostracizing them, then uh, it's done. And uh, yeah, do we, do we see um, um, now that it doesn't make sense, you know, to speak of, of a wave, et cetera? I, I think that, um, you know, that, that, um, 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 that's an observation that you have, not that populism comes in way over time, right? But I think that 
you know, um, this doesn't mean that we should pay less attention to the phenomenon or not, you know, use the occasion to study. Um, but, but of course, I mean, that's, you know, an observation um, that's true for many things. <laughs> uh, 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 democratization seems to happen in ways too. Um, so I think let's do one more. Round. Thank uh, you, Senator Question. I'm going to abuse my 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 chairing <laughs> position protector, but then I'm going to hand over to you. The um, Patrick, you talked a lot about foreign policy, which I find super interesting and obviously very important. If you would zoom in onto diplomacy, um, is it possible to say that there are certain features of a populist diplomacy? Uh, so. Basically, one I think you you mentioned so, so either sidelining the foreign ministry that would be the U.S. case or revamping it entirely that would be the Hungarian case. Um, what about uh, the the leader actually? So how, how is, is there is there some something that they share in common? Is populist leaders are like right wing populist leaders when they when they when they act on the diplomatic stage? So do they, for instance look more at a domestic audience than an international one or more. do they behave sometimes with Trump, I thought, even 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 with uh, with, with with Boris Johnson, always almost behaving like some celebrity diplomats, you know, so in very goofy ways sometimes. And, and so is it possible to say that there are these these features of a of a of populist diplomacy? Sort of following in on that same thing foreign policy and taking the specific case of Hungary. Uh, I think Orban always complains about the Treaty of Fiant and then recently publicizing that with his scarf showing the 1918 boundaries of, of Hungary. How, how does that gel and fit in with having good relations across the EU, where basically it appears he's making territorial demands on several neighboring states? and so on the one hand, he's making promises, but you can't really, or raising expectations, you can't deliver. So this makes me think of what are the internal contradictions within populism, and will these eventually lead to it losing its vigor and power? Thank you. Any more questions, comments? Last opportunity. Yes. <laughs> uh, about the um, media and social media to follow up on that. So populism uh, is bred, I suppose you could say, by disinformation in many ways. How can you uh, educate a public about whether it's foreign policy or any other issue in terms of like media literacy? The media literacy is so important. There was an article in the New York Times yesterday about Finland and how they teach media literacy at several points in their curriculum. So what is one of the prescriptions to uh, prevent populism from getting out of control? Thank you. Any last comments, questions? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, foreign policy and, and uh, diplomatic practices. Um, I, I can only, you know, speak from from those who are that, you know, that I'm familiar with. But um, you know, what you what you commonly see is that you want to centralize the vision making, right? So, so that you know, the populist leader they interpret national interests, um, and and then you know, this becomes quite uh, top down. I mean, we had, for example, diplomats in the Hungarian foreign ministry, you know, that you know used to be experts on issues and informing government policy basically saying that two things can happen, right? Either we get orders on issues that matter to the populist leadership, or we have to read the newspaper to find out what the populist leadership thinks about an issue, because we don't want to decide on our own, because all our parameters, our expertise, according to which we decide, no might not be appreciated, and, and, and you want to know what you uh, should do in a situation where you have very little, you know, own a leeway to take uh, decisions and also um, to inform, right? So, so that would be, you know, uh, one of the, the aspects. But I could uh, think, you know, that if you started this in depth, you could link, you know, certain st uh, styles of populist policy making to diplomatic practices. And, and uh, I think that would be a very interesting um, research. Um, 
Good. Uh, then, then I have the social media uh, questions and and media literature. But but here I really feel you know that you know populism is part you know of the issues we face. But you know even if there wouldn't be populism and uh, media literacy, I think becomes incredibly uh, important. Um, and what you also see is that you know you mentioned you know these concepts like resilience building that pop up in strategic documents and then they're implemented. And we see, you know, that particularly in certain countries, you know, um, there's a lot of these projects that you mentioned, for example, countries and that has less to do with the populism, probably about more with foreign interference. Now, the Baltic countries, they get a lot of support you now from new countries on these kind of projects. Now, they have the Russian minorities there that is a concern you now. So, so on many issues, you know, even, you know, if I educate my own children, you now media literacy becomes a big issue because you see how it is. You know, informed themselves even in a young age. Now, so I wouldn't be that limited to populism, but I would fully agree that, you know, it's important to invest in those things when you talk about things, you know, like preserving democracy and being resilient, having open societies you now that are resilient. And, and uh, yeah. Thank say. you. Patrick, then thanks a lot for a great talk. We learned a lot about populism.